So welcome everyone. I'm Professor Zakaria. I'm the Chair of Classics and Archaeology, and this is our 16th annual Classics and Archaeology Symposium. This is a moment of celebration of all our seniors who are going to share with you their capstone projects. It is a moment of celebration of our department that devotes so much of our efforts to make sure that you do well. And we're here to cherish the time we spend together and what you've learned. Um, at the end of these seven presentations, we will have the awards. Then our postdoc instructor is going to give his talk, and then we will move to the bioethics um, patio for lunch. So what I'll do, the presentations will be about 15 minutes each, and we'll have a few questions at the end. And at the very end, we'll have more questions for all the presenters. So please stay, and there will be more of us uh, joining uh, as classes end. So um, for each one of the speakers, as you'll see, the professor that worked with that student will introduce the student, but let me first say something about Harley. Uh, Harley has been a, um, a staple of the department. His kindness, politeness, uh, work ethic, and um, general positive attitude is leaving a mark. So I personally want to thank him. He's worked with me. He's done two capstones. <laughs> so you know, he did one on the ancient world and film. And this year he's doing, uh, he's finishing his capstone with Professor Sauvage, who will introduce him. And he's hoping he's done an archaeological excavation. He'll do another one. So he's hoping to continue into grad studies. So thank you, Harley. Caroline, come and introduce. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Professor Sauvage. Um, I'm the, the archaeology side of uh, the classics and archaeology department. Uh, Karina already said a lot about Harley. Um, yes, we will miss him next year, but I'm sure that he will come and visit uh, unless he goes uh, somewhere far, far, far away from grad school, uh, which will happen hopefully very soon. Uh, not that we want you far away, but <laughs> grad school uh, will happen soon. Um, so he will present the result of uh, his research in a class that was on uh, Near Eastern religions, most like, uh, especially in Mesopotamia and the Levant. And it is about the power of language through magic in ancient Mesopotamia. So you will hear everything that you need to know about magic, speech, and powerful being in the ancient world of Mesopotamia. So, how are you? Hello, everyone. Uh, as I've already been introduced, my name is Harley, and I will be doing my presentation um, on magic, and specifically the vocal aspects of magic in ancient Mesopotamia. There we go. All right. Uh, so, where does magic come from? In short, all magic came from the gods. Um, and the myths of the Mesopotamian help us understand how they conceived the magic. Uh, in the myth, the epic of creation, when describing Marduk, it says, uh, when his lips moved, fire blazed forth. So it can be gleaned that one, God's words were innately magical, and two, Marduk's words were uh, more powerful than any other god um, because his created a physical manifestation of power when others did not, which also foreshadows uh, his ascendancy to the head of the pantheon later on in the uh, myth. Fun fact, uh, this picture uh, on the screen is uh, the most accurate picture I could find based off of the description in the myth, and it comes from a 1980s Ghostbusters cartoon. Um, also in the epic of creation, uh, the primordial uh, goddess of uh, salt water, Tiamat, uh, and the opposition to Marduk uh, is also portrayed with having the innate, uh, innate power in her speech. Um, her orders were so powerful they could not be disobeyed. While there is no physical manifestation of her power, it is evident that her words are powerful as her orders literally could not be disobeyed. It also establishes a hierarchy of power. Some gods' magic was far more potent than other gods, um, giving them the ability to influence some of, uh, some others 
Some gods had a level of protection from this, however, uh, through items of power, which I will discuss towards the end of uh, my uh, presentation. <clears throat> so, does that mean that humans were also innately magical? No. In fact, uh, the, through inscriptions and spells, uh, it becomes clear that they rely on the power of gods for magic often invoking the name of a god or referencing a time that a god used the spell um, in order to uh, prove its legitimacy. Graham Cunningham says incantations were the principal verbal technique for uh, requesting or representing helpful divine intervention. In other words, humans did not have magical power to do it themselves. The gods that were most commonly called upon were Marduk, Anki, and Shamash, However, there were also more uh, household-oriented uh, gods that they also prayed to as well. Mm -hmm. One of the things that was imbued with magic for the Mesopotamians was the transfer of power. In the Epic of Creation, there are parallel scenes uh, where the two leaders are either uh, transferring power or being transferred power. Uh, Tiamat granted Kingu uh, her uh, uh, answer to Marduk, uh, his kingship of the gods, while Marduk gained his kingship via oaths sworn by his peers. For Kingu, his power was limited to whatever power Tiamat already had um, and whatever she was willing to grant him, uh, whereas Marduk gained his power through the oaths. Oaths are magically binding and therefore... Uh, the power that was granted cannot be taken away. That concept would have uh, been the same for the earthly believers, the same as the gods. Uh, kings would have received oaths of loyalty from their uh, subordinates, and that uh, loyalty and power that they gave the king could not be taken away, whereas governors would have received their power from the king, but that power could be taken away at any time because the king is not swearing an oath to the governor. Witchcraft, black and white magic. Scholars today argue that there is a separation of magical practices between black and white. White magic being uh, the legally practiced magic by priests and royal uh, magicians, uh, black magic being illegal magic used by witches and sorcerers. For the sake of this presentation, the difference between black and white magic does not matter. Witches, uh, <laughs> also called warlocks, sorcerers, and sorcerers, were amateur magicians who uh, illegally and secretly used magic to cause harm to another person. Westbrook, the author of Witchcraft uh, and the Law in, ancient ne in the Ancient Near East, says uh, sorcerers used exactly the same techniques and spells for their illegitimate purposes uh, that the victims might use to defend themselves legitimately. Legal magic was done by uh, royal and temple magicians um, that were controlled by the government. So therefore, the only reason why witchcraft was illegal was because the government was not controlling uh, their magic. An example of magic done in myth that represents witchcraft in, uh, comes from the Epic of Creation. Just before the battle between Marduk and Tiamat, Tiamat is outwardly friendly towards him. But the myth also states, Tiamat cast her spell. She did not even turn her neck. In her lips, she was holding falsehoods, lies, weed lips. Uh, it helped set the precedent that witchcraft is done in secret and meant to do harm despite outwardly, uh, an outwardly friendly demeanor, witchcraft and law. Witchcraft was common enough and enough of a problem for punishments to be codified in Mesopotamian laws. One such law code uh, was the famous Hammurabi's Code. Um, the law uh, dealing with, with witchcraft was the overall second law in the code. The law, uh, the law summarized uh, says, if a person accused of witchcraft um, must, uh, if a person is accused of witchcraft, they must jump into a river. If they uh, drown, they are considered guilty and the accuser may take their property. If uh, they uh, float and they survive, um, they are innocent and the accuser is put to death. So if you want to be a witch, learn how to swim. If you want to make money fast, 
find somebody who doesn't know how to swim. Um, and so again, the overall position of the law being the second law uh, emphasizes its importance. Similarly, six, about 600 years later, there's an Assyrian law code um, that states that uh, if someone overhears witchcraft happening, uh, they must report it to uh, the king. And if they could not identify the witch, the king uh, himself would order an investigation to find eyewitnesses or the witch themselves. Um, setting up an investigation to hunt down, uh, hunt down the witch is enough of a logistical equip, uh, commit, excuse me, commitment to know that they uh, took these charges seriously because anybody could cause harm to another person via magic, and that meant the average person could attack authorities uh, without being identified. Uh, a witch's main form of assault was the curse, a spoken spell that was intended to do harm to, uh, to its target. However, there are no known recordings of curses used by witches. There is evidence of it through mythological precedents uh, and that comes in the form of uh, the myth, the descent of Ishtar into the underworld, uh, where Arishkagal, the goddess of the underworld, curses her sister Ishtar, the goddess of fertility and war, with 60 diseases. A curse to her eyes, arms, feet, heart, head, every part of her body. Gods, uh, gods and humans alike were vulnerable to the uh, magical curses. As seen in the myth, curses were often intended to do uh, physical harm and could even lead to death. While the myth does not explicitly state Ishtar died, it is implied by the fact that fertility left the world after, that she, after she was cursed that she did. Ishtar was only able to be cursed uh, because she uh, had all of her items of power removed from her, which again, we will talk about later. According to Benjamin R. Foster in his book Before the Muses, many counter curses also stated uh, had this like return to sender style to them. So it was the same uh, magic used against them to curse uh, the witch back. Some of the most common form of counter curses were the ones that attacked a witch's ability to speak. Uh, we can see in the myth as, uh, in myth, this in myth as well. Uh, in the Epic of Creation, Marduk sends uh, one of his winds that he controls into the mouth of Tiamat preventing her from speaking or uh, rendering, and rendering her unable to continue her magical assault against him. There have been uh, many inscriptions of countercurses uh, and inc excuse me, countercurse incantations found in the archaeological record. One such incantation, incantation states, until I rip out his tongue, until I send his words back to his mouth, I will not allow him uh, I will not allow his mouth to speak. Uh, the ritual, the counter uh, curses seek to mute uh, the witch or the person who is attacking with, the ma with magic uh, so that they can no longer uh, have effective magic. Therefore, language speaking is the key to uh, magical uh, effectiveness. Rituals were meant to enhance magical power um, the magical power of the spell and required a lot of preparation and had to be practiced in exactly the correct way, which is why uh, there are so many written accounts of uh, rituals, so that they did not mess up the process. Rituals could potentially require uh, expensive and exotic items, uh, limiting who can use them and creating a built-in excuse for them failing due to the incorrect item being used or uh, the item being fr uh, sourced from a bad location. One of the most common genres of rituals uh, attacked the witch's ability to speak so that they could uh, not continue ma to magically assault them, which uh, parallels the, the incantation spoken earlier. One ritual involved putting salt in a figurine's mouth and the figurine is a substitute for the witch since the witch is not actually there. And, uh, and then, they burn the mouth. Again, muting the witch so that the uh, magical, uh, 
assault would not continue and effectively ending any future assaults that they might try on anyone else. Finally, we get to the items of power. The Mesopotamians believed that some objects protected the wearer from uh, magical power as well as enhanced their magical power. Uh, in the descent of Ishtar, while going through the seven gates to the underworld, she was stripped of all of her items of power, her crown, her earrings, her bead, her bead necklace, her toggle pins, her girdle of birthstones, her bangles, and finally, her garments. She was stripped of all of her items, literally left her nude, which left her uh, vulnerable, not just physically, but also to Arishkagol's uh, attacks through curses. On the opposite end, Marduk gains uh, objects of power when he is elevated uh, to the position of the king of gods, giving him uh, the magical ability and protection to defeat Tiamat. In the epic of creation, it says, they invested him with scepter, throne and staff of office. They gave him unfaceable weapons to crush his foe, clothed him in cloak of awesome armor, his head crowned with terrible radiance. Um, the interesting thing is that this reflects the items that a king would receive. As you can see in the photo, he has a crown, he has a scepter, he has a throne. These objects would have seen, been seen as the ultimate form of protection and enhancing the king's power uh, uh, with magic. Uh, the use of items of power, though, was not limited to just the rich and powerful. Many of the lower classes uh, have been found uh, with amulets uh, that they have received from temple priests, um, and that would ward off evil magics, as well as other maladies like headaches or even help a uh, colicky baby. In conclusion, uh, magic was a major part of the everyday life of an ancient Mesopotamian, um, and spoken language was the most important part of magic. And while rituals and items of power helped enhance and protect from magic, it was always spoken magic that was targeted to be counteracted when dealing with witches and adversary gods. Therefore, it is the most important part and the most essential part of magic. Thank you for listening to my presentation. Great job, uh, Carly, and thank you for not putting a spell on us. And I uh, hope you'll have some amulets for us to ward off evil at the end. Questions to Harley? May I can? Yes. Um, can you like quickly? So uh, white magic is legal, it's done by the government, and black magic is illegal, it's done by amateur magicians who uh, are mostly seeking to do harm. And do you have a lot of examples of uh, men or women? I mean, is it at all gender? Do you have examples of this? So, yes, there's... Um, it's not exactly written, so like the actual prosecution of witches rarely ever happened um, because the punishments for being wrong about saying someone is a witch um, is typically death. Um, so uh, it was a serious accusation and it, it was hard to prove. So if you couldn't prove it, you were put to death. So it was rarely ever actually uh, legally uh, prosecuted. Yes, Kate. Uh, do you have any favorite uh, spells? Um, yeah, actually. Um, so the one that uh, I put up there earlier, that was essentially, I will rip out your tongue. Um, there's, there's a whole lot of that. There's also quite a few of like, I will cut your throat. Um, I, yeah, I, I can't think of like the exact name of it right now, but they get pretty vindictive, some of these things, which is kind of fun to read about. Yes? So, the Hades Gate, the Hades Gate, um, I'm wondering, from some of your other classes you've taken, mm -hmm. if you found some similarities or differences between what Mesopotamia was doing versus um, a more classical period or um, so, um, I don't know too much about 
the more classical side of magic. Um, I know that in uh, biblical times, there were quite a few similar things. Um, they uh, also looked down, like uh, Judea and Israel sort of looked down upon the magic that was being cast by uh, these other Near Eastern areas um, because they were giving power to gods that were not God. Um, at least that is what I remember from my other courses. This is great, Carly. I, I have a couple more questions, but I think since we're a little late, what I suggest we do is we move on, and at the end, we might have a moment for all presenters to come up and, you know, again, think about it and ask them questions. So, Harley, thank you. So, at this point, I'd like to introduce you to our next speaker, uh, Melanie Rodriguez. There's uh, five speakers who will be, have five presenters who have taken my class on representations of Greece, ancient and modern. And so there will be a, a lot more coming uh, after their classes. Let me say a couple of words about um, Melanie. Melanie is a double major in English and classics and archaeology. Um, a first generation student uh, who uh, worked hard all the way through here. So this is a work in progress. It's not finished, but it follows nicely. That's the order of the, uh, um, the presentations. It follows nicely on sorcery. Uh, we will be talking about Medea, the othered woman, and why was she othered. So, uh, Melanie, please come along. Introduce me, my name is Melanie. Um, and yeah, I'm a first gen student, double major, and um, this is, uh, I'm still doing a lot of research on this topic, so I'm not done yet. Um, so, I'll just be presenting my main ideas and my main points. Um, so today my presentation is called Medea and Modern Woman in Greek Film. So after watching um, a lot of films from the LA Greek Film Festival, um, I, I noticed some similarities between the women that were being represented in modern Greek films and the character Medea from Eurybides um, Medea. Um, so this year, um, Medea was actually um, adapted into a film by a director, so um, Dimitri Athanides. Um, so similar to Medea, the, the women in the films like Patchwork, um, Builders, and Housewives, and the, mod and the construction of modern Athens um, are all subjected to um, stereotypical gender dynamics from the patriarchal society that they are placed in. And um, Medea represents a woman who um, rebels against the patriarchy and in response creates a male anxiety as she challenges the power in um, from um, yeah. so I just have some bullet points right here um, so um, the stereotypical role from women is mostly recognized as a daughter a wife a mother and are mainly roles that only benefit men and keep the women powerless. Um, during the marriage of Medea to Jason, um, she had two children with him, but then he decided to leave her for um, another um, Greek princess. And in her reproach to Jason, she expresses her hatred to him. Um, however, he defends himself by saying that his actions were for the advancement of the whole family. Um, Jason also tells Medea that she does not compare to um, the princess because she is not Greek. So in this sense, um, Jason was othering Medea because um, she is not Greek um, and making an excuse for why he decided to leave her and um, like alienate her. Um, in addition, when um, she murders the princess and her children to spite Jason, um, he says that a proper Greek woman would have never done that. Um, further othering her from himself and from the princess, which he's comparing her to. And that is a screenshot from the film. Um, and the next uh, film that I will talk about is Builders, Housewives, and the Construction of Modern Athens. So in this film, we are presented with um, the 
gendered roles of, of the household that are fixed in the dynamic of a working husband and a housewife. Um, during the construction of modern Athens, the men turned to easier jobs that did not require much experience and could rely on their physical labor. The women, on the other hand, stayed home to care for the children and tended to chores at home um, rather than having other jobs. Throughout the documentary, older couples were interviewed and speak about their lives solely based on the role of whether they were a builder or whether they were a housewife. Um, in Stuart Hall's representation, he says that a stereotype reduces everything about the person to those traits, exaggerates and exemplifies them. Um, so regardless, the builder had more power in the dynamic and the relationship because he benefited from having um, the wife take care of the home and um, that power imbalance. Um, the divide between the genders in a traditional marriage were made and fixed into the city um, as it was being created. Um, so, this is another screenshot from the film. Um, so following the 2008 financial crisis, women often became um, the only breadwinners of the house as um, finding jobs was difficult. So um, this created a, um, a difference in the patriarchal hierarchy as the women became the breadwinners. So in the film Patchwork, the main character Char Chara is a mother and a wife and also sustains a job. Her life is seen as perfect um, because she has a family and is following the societal norms that say that she should be a wife and a mother. Um, however, she carries a lot of childhood trauma um, from her mother's abandonment. Um, Chara is clearly upset from her actions um, that, her, that her mother did and doesn't understand why her mother couldn't have stayed and um, been a proper mother to her. Um, so as she contemplates her own role as a mother, she decides or she um, comes to the realization that she is also not um, fully content with just being a mother and just being a wife. Um, she realizes that um, she needs to remove herself from that, from that environment. And as a result, is seen unstable for wanting to um, pursue herself um, instead of um, her marriage. Um, so this leads Chara to be able to put herself into her mother's shoes and be able to calm her anger that she felt after she was abandoned. Um, she looks to her own daughter and she realizes that even though she loves her very much, um, being a mother is not the only thing that defines her. Um, at the end of the film, she's able to heal herself and um, decides to make a move and try to um, heal the relationship with her mother. Um, she is a modern representation of a woman who is facing societal stereotypes that were forcing her into a life of being a wife and being a mother, but she decides to stand up and push against those roles. Um, so overall, I compared Medea and the modern woman that I, were, that I was seeing in these films, and I came to the conclusion that um, it is important to create a discourse about this topic and be able to understand why stereotypes are harmful. And um, Medea and other characters in these films are rebelling against stereotypes and the patriarchy um, that um, is being represented as put, putting them down. And um, while Medea is an intense example of challenging the patriarchy, modern Greek films are addressing the role of the woman as a more um, as against the, the stereotype of being a compliant housewife and a mother. And yeah, this is my So Melanie, so Melanie, can you tell us um, why were you interested in this topic? Yeah, so I was, sorry, my voice is a little bit I was interested in this topic of um, Medea because it reminded me of um, some stories that I have from my own culture. So um, the story of Medea being alienated and being othered, I found very similar to the story of um, this character named Malinche, which is um, the first woman who was met with Hernan Cortez and um, became his um translator and also had his children. So um, Malinche is seen negatively and whenever um, you do something bad, somebody will call you like a Malinche, it just has a negative um, connotation. 
and also um, because she was a woman. Any questions for Melanie? Uh, you should see the film, so. <laughs> yes. Thanks so much for your great talk. I, I was just wondering about, you know, you're you sort of you're thinking about um, the idea and, you know, the way that she pushes back against patriarchy. What do you think about, you know, the sort of violence of her response and, you know, her treatment of her children? I mean, is she just kind of passing on the violence that she suffered from Jason? Um, you know, is it is it just a is it kind of a result of human society, or is it really coming from deep within herself? I just wonder if you sort of had any thoughts about you know the way that she resists patriarchal uh, authority. Yeah. Um, well, I don't agree with the violence. I don't think that's good. <laughs> but um, I think that it was a result of probably the time and um, just having that um, kind of like story and that example. Um, I think overall, it it was like. A good way to kind of show that like how she was pushed to that extent um, and just kind of like the result of that and um, yeah sorry I don't know if I answered that. Thank you Melanie that's uh, that's good thank you for this okay. Let me introduce you to Chloe Heidmeier. Uh, Chloe took the course with me last year so a year ago as a junior as she was hoping she would travel to France, I think, in the fall. And the pandemic, of course, uh, threw off all the plans. Um, so now she had the opportunity to think about what she saw last year, find a film and enrich it with what she learned in another class, the course on ancient epics by uh, Chris uh, Gibson. So uh, this is a new work that she wrote for this presentation uh, based on what she had submitted before. Um, so Chloe, um, please come along. And it is Greek myths in contemporary Greek cinema. And then this is the button that lets uh, hi everyone, um, like you introduced, my name is Chloe J. Hightower and my presentation will be on Greek mythology and contemporary Greek cinema. This presentation is a summary of what I've learned in my short time at LMU and specifically what I learned in my capstone course, Representations of Greece. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, the culture of Greece has been glamorized by the West in many ways. Greek culture, already ingrained into our arts and politics, made its way into modern forms of art consumption, whether it's advertising the strength of the Panama Canal or to tell a valiant story in a film. This is because the valiant stories of Greek, for, uh, Greek heroes uh, al aligned with the uh, ideal story of picking one's self from the bootstraps. The stories of anthropomorphic being, whether being of divine lineage or not, going against one's belonging to the ordinary and defeating challenges, physical and metaphorical, that seemed so monstrous that it had been deemed impossible, resonated with the American public. However, little is said about how the Greek public interprets their own stories and how they express it in their art. So in my essay, as um, Dr. Z explained, um, I explored three movies that were uh, Greek films that had motifs uh, to Greek mythology, but for the uh, sake of time, I'm going to be focusing on one of the movies, and it's called Vazi's Odyssey. It's directed by Vasileos, oh, I'm so sorry, Papathiokaris, and it's released in 2020, so it came out two years ago, and has a runtime of 104 minutes. So, to this Greek director, uh, in Vazi's Odyssey, there are traces of ancient myth in his story in an effort to showcase personal transformation in the protagonist. Um, it explores personal change in the protagonist through little, literal and metaphorical journeys, making references and comparisons to um, the Odyssey and its most notable plot points to illustrate its own story. With its many references and comparisons, it, sh it showcases that Greek filmmakers draw, draw upon their culture, which is ro romanticized excessively in the world, and subvert what is known about their culture to express a unique and raw point of view. And so the results that I found in my research showed that he achieved this with multiple motifs found in the Odyssey. So first we have the theme of Nostos, which details a hero returning home to sea, by sea. Nostos often occurs after a collection of trials and tribulations 
and it is deemed a high honor to return from such challenges. There is also a theme of monstrous obstacles standing in the protagonist's way. And I'll be able to explain that in the following slides. We also have a theme of thievery that is also found in both Homer and Vazi's Odyssey. And the filmmaker uses this theme to provide catalysts for becoming a better person for the protagonist. And the final motif notable in the Odyssey found in the film is Catabasis, in which the film subverts the, this motif in a form of a drug trip that Vazi takes. <laughs> These four motifs collectively bring implications of Homer's classic story with the purpose of supplying the protagonist with transform transformational situations that challenge his current values and actions. So first I will detail the motif of the monstrous beings that taunts the, um, both protagonists in both stories. So and first in the Homer's Odyssey, the original Odyssey, we have um, Odysseus leaving Circe's island in book 12, and him and his crew come across the island of sirens who sing a seductive song. But as instructed by Circe, they all plug their ears and evade the sirens. They then come across a six-headed reptilian, Scylla, and, their, and his whirlpool companion, Charybdis. Odysseus evades the monsters by hugging against the cliff of, the, of Scylla's lair, but not without Scylla swooping down and killing six of Odysseus's men. So we have these two art depictions of Scylla specifically and the whirlpool being in the ocean. Sorry. The Sirens, Scylla, and Charybdis are the notable monstrous obstacles that stand in the way of Odysseus. And Vasileos Papatheocaris, the director of, of Vazi's Odyssey, draws allusions to the monsters standing in the way of the heroes in this film. Vazi, played by the director himself, is in, debt, is in debt because of a loan he took out for a movie that failed at the box office. Before Vazi departs on his journey, we see people dressed up in various costumes, such as a unicorn or a teddy bear, outside his trailer. He repeatedly yells at them to go away and that I'm not paying him, which connotes the people in, in um, costumes being from the bank that he owes. The director cho chooses to make <laughs> the director chooses to make debt collectors dress, dress like mythical creatures to remark on the mythical creatures that prevent Odysseus from going home. The people in costumes also remind Vazi that he cannot run away from his problems, and thus their presence in the film serves as an incentive to proceed with changing his current ways for the sake of him and his family. The next motif that is found in both Fazi's Odyssey and Homer's Odyssey is thievery and illegal acts. While Homer's Odyssey does not concert with the legal court in his story, there are instances of disobedience in Homer's story that the director infers in his own interpretation. Also in book 12 of Homer's Odyssey, oh, Homer's Odyssey, yeah, Homer's Odyssey, there you go. <laughs> Odysseus was told by Circe to avoid the Isle of Helios and to not eat his cattle. His crew, however, persuades Odysseus to land on the island, and thus they disobey his orders to not kill any cattle. Helios reacts by threatening the gods with taking the sun to the underworld, inciting the gods to en enact vengeance upon Odysseus. The ship was struck by Zeus's lightning by instruction of Helios, and, their crew per and the crew perished, with Odysseus being the only survivor. This is an instance of disobedience on Odysseus and the crew disrupting their course. The filmmaker, I know, yeah, I tried to turn up the contrast so you can see these screenshots, but on the far right side, you see these screenshots of in the movie where um, when Vazi and his companion Alexandra stop by a carnival along their journey, Vazi spots an arcade that he played frequently when he was young. He sends Alexandra away so he can play with this game. A scene later, while Alexandria is sleeping, Vazi is seen stealing the game and driving away while the carnival workers are chasing him down. The setting of the carnival is tempting to Vazi, an allusion to the island of Helios that the crew and eventually Odysseus are tempted to visit. Stealing something from this tempestuous setting is an allusion to Helios' cattle. After he steals the arcade, he lies to Alexandria saying that the two guys wanted to rob him. He has now fallen back into his habit of lying, and when this happens, this causes a rift in their relationship, which eventually, in the story, causes him to realize the error of his ways. Thus, the result of him stealing the arcade game is him changing and realizing the flaws of his character and thus changing for the better. The final motif I will discuss that the director drew from Homer's Odyssey is the inclusion of Catabasis. During my time at LMU, I have done extensive research on the motif of Catabasis in ancient myth and its significance in Near Eastern culture. The term catabasis re refers to a literal downhill descent of any type. But in ancient stories like in Homer's Odyssey, the catabasis 
as they descend into the underworld where, where the hero in a myth, epic poem, or tragedy receives knowledge that couldn't be received in the mortal world. Vasilios, the director, subverts the concept of catabasis and doesn't explicitly detail a descent of any kind. However, Vazi in Vazi's Odyssey takes a, a mushroom and has a drug trip that has many similarities to the catabasis in Homer's Odyssey. In Book 11, Odysseus is under the enticing spell of Circe still and has been her par partner for a year. Initially, deceitfully towards Odysseus and his men, Circe, in ooh, excuse me. Circe insists on helping Odysseus. He follows Circe's advice to seek the underworld and ask for the br blind Theban prophet Tiresias for his advice in order for him and his men to successfully return home. When he enters the underworld, he meets deceased loved ones and warriors and receives many warnings and pieces of advice. Similarly, when Vazi and Vazi's Odyssey finally parts ways with Alexandria as they both reach, reach Greece, Vazi is still reminded of his debt by his uncle, so then he takes a mushroom and has a trip. During this trip, he has a vision of him running away from ghosts. The director, as, as you can see, is very hard to see, but those are ghosts following him. <laughs> um, the director includes this image to allude to the Catabasis in the Odyssey, where Odysseus sees ghostly apparitions of his loved ones. He also includes this image to signify his actions are haunting him, and running away will not solve any of his problems. <laughs> the motif of Catabasis in the Odyssey makes the Odysseus seek his journey in a more cautious manner, even though he eventually fails. The director took this motif of the Catabasis, and instead of going into the underworld, he goes to the depths of his subconscious during the drug trip, drug trip, and it unearths his guilt by running away from the debt that he must pay. So that was the primary bulk of the uh, research for, um, for, for Vazi's Odyssey, at least. And the first step in my methodology to come to these conclusions was to focus on primary resources. So first I read Homer's Odyssey, and I revisited my notes from this myth from the previous year and the previous semester from different classes, as explained by Dr. Z in Epic Poetry and Classic, Classical Near Eastern Myth, both, both taught by Chris Gibson, and Representations of Greece taught by Dr. Z. From my ter tertiary sources, I referred back to my textbooks from Representations of Greece, which are Hellenism's culture, identity, and ethnicity from antiquity to modernity, by Dr. Z, <laughs> and representations, cultural representations of sign signifying practices. The former explores the facets of Greek ethnicity and Greek culture's legacy from the past and present Greek, uh, for the past and present Greeks amongst the diaspora. The latter explores the origins and functions of representation and how the world's view on certain cultures is manipulated by the exposure through colonization. Alongside watching Vaz's Odyssey, I took notes of any plot points similarly to those in Homer's Odyssey to compare characters, events, and scenes. In conclusion, the director of Vaz's Odyssey included many motifs from Homer's Odyssey to give the protagonist an opportunity to grow from the faults of his character and change for the better. Vazi travels to Greece to ex escape the debt collectors, but along the way found that he had been the root of every obstacle because of his behavior. Through a plethora of setbacks and a drug-induced drug catabasis, he begins to reckon with his actions and how his dishonesty, mischief, and recklessness set in motion a series of unfortunate events. Vasileos, the director, told the story through the structure of the Odyssey to illustrate the protagonist's journey through redemption with the inclusion of trials and tribulations that lead to his eventual change. And that's my work cited. Thank you. Great job, Chloe. So questions from uh, anyone? Um, thank you so much. That was, that was really fun. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so what, this director just kind of like to vaguely reference, so they weren't, they were literally just like in a, like a, a, a cloth and like <laughs> and eyes, so he's just like running from like faceless ghosts. But it did draw allusions to me, I didn't uh, mention here, but it did draw allusions to like just when Odysseus kind of gets overwhelmed with everyone being like, where's my family? Can you, can you help me? Where's my family? And he's like, oh my God, and then he goes back up. And so, like, I kind of just, like, thought that he drew that conclusion just to, like, represent that that's him really reckoning with, like, what he's doing. He's literally running away from his problems. So it was just kind of, like, a loose reference. So, yeah, they were just random posts. <laughs>
So I'll introduce you now to Miles Kovalik, who is a major in film production uh, with a minor in classics and archaeology that he just started. Um, um, Miles took the course of representations last uh, spring, but he also took the uh, Summer Undergraduate Research Fellowship and worked on his first screenplay. Um, so he, he will tell you more on how he decided on the topic of the screenplay and how he integrated the course material. Miles. Hello everyone, I am Miles Kovalik. I am a junior film production major with minors in screenwriting, art history, and I just added a classics and archaeology minor. Um, so today I'm here to talk about um, the project I did for the summer undergraduate research program um, last summer in 2021, um, advised by Professor Zakharov. Um, so this is writing the other into a feature screen. All right. Um, so for background on this, um, I took Professor Zachariah's class, Representations of Greece, Ancient Modern, uh, a year ago. Um, and in this class, we learned a lot about the practice of representation in media, um, which is a powerful tool for how we shape narratives about um, ourselves and other people groups. Um, so to do this, we read um, the textbook Representation by Stuart Hall, um, as well as supplemental texts like Herodotus's <laughs> Histories, and Professor Zachariah's book, Hellenisms. Um, so in all of these books, the concept of the other comes up often. Um, and this is the idea that people will, of, people will often demonize another people group um, as being the exact opposite of themselves in every way. Um, for example, they'll call out another group for being bloodthirsty, whereas we are civilized. They are godless, whereas we are pious. They are ignorant, whereas we are intelligent. Um, so they do this not necessarily because it is true, um, but because it helps them define themselves who they are as a group um, by what they are not. So this is exactly how Herodotus uses the Scythians, which is a rival people group, to the Athenians um, in his histories. So the three examples I mentioned earlier are exactly what he does. He calls the Scythians out for being bloodthirsty, whereas he said the Athenians are more civilized. Um, they worship the wrong gods, whereas we worship the right gods. Um, and they are ignorant, whereas we have institutions of learning and are intelligent. Um, so this concept of the other is something that comes up a lot in antiquity. Um, and uh, one of the authors that we read brought up the idea of holding the other up as a mirror or as a foil, um, which is the idea that only through um, seeing ourselves reflected in another people group can we truly recognize who we are. Um, and this is what um, Herodotus does with the Scythians, um, to, to point out what makes somebody Greek, what makes somebody Athenian. Um, he can only do this through using another people group as an example. Um, so for the class, I had to write a research paper, which was turned into a blog on films selected for the uh, Los Angeles Greek Film Festival that year. Um, and for my topic for that, I chose um, autochthony and nativism in Greek cinema. Um, so just a quick summary of that long paper. Um, uh, I start out by discussing the Greek myth of autochthony. Um, and uh, that is the idea that the Greeks were born from the land they live in, and they have always lived in Attica or, or Athens where they were born. Um, I call this a myth because it does have, it is not necessarily true. Um, as we all know, people move around, um, things change. So the idea that the people that live in Athens today have ancestors that can trace the roots all the way back to prehistory um, is not necessarily true. Um, but this is a myth that many um, Athenians um, in antiquity, as well as some today, hold on to with positive connotations um, because they think that living in the same place over such an extended amount of time gives them an advantage. Um, they talk about how it leads to them becoming civilized before maybe other nomadic groups were able to. Um, this is something that Herodotus talks about, um, how the Scythians, because they're nomadic, because they're moving around, they haven't been able to settle and civilize like the Athenians have. Um, and then, so updating that into the modern day, um, there was a big financial crisis in Greece in 2008 um, that affected a lot of the population that was living there um, at the time in a, a negative way. Um, they lost a lot of jobs, there was high unemployment, um, and for many citizens of Greece, um, they felt like this myth of autochthony, which manifests itself in modern days as the idea of nativism, 
um, as a negative. Um, in 2004, the Olympics were held in Athens, and as part of that, there was a huge advertising campaign that marketed Greece as um, modern day Greece as a bastion of the ancient. So like you'd see a lot of commercials with um, the Parthenon or ancient philosophers standing around, um, totally disregarding the contemporary population of Greece. Um, so then when we come to the modern Greek films that are being made um, in this movement called the Modern Greek Weird Wave, um, which Yorgos Lanthimos is probably the most famous director, um, they often use um, outsiders as protagonists to describe how they feel as contemporary Greek citizens um, kind of otherized and put outside of society because of this focus on antiquity. Um, so in a lot of movies that we watched, they use um, outsiders as protagonists. So this still is from a movie called Daniel 16, which is made by Greek filmmakers in Greece. But Daniel is actually a German immigrant um, um, who's brought to Greece and put into juvie in Greece, um, which is an actual thing that Germans would have ju juvenile delinquent facilities in Greece. Um, so that just shows Daniel is an outsider in Greece, um, but a lot of Greek um, citizens would, would connect with him because they feel um, kind of like outsiders because of the financial crisis and other things that the government was doing at the time. Um, I also took a still from Vassy's Odyssey where they talk about um, the crisis and how it negatively affected them all. So that, that was a summary of um, my research paper. Um, but now on to what I actually did for the summer undergraduate research program last summer. Um, my project was, I set out to write a feature in six weeks. Um, so I'm a screenwriting minor, but I, at this point I had never written a feature before. So even that was going to be a challenge for me, simply writing a script in six weeks. Um, however, um, I also, working with Professor Zachariah, I also wanted to incorporate this idea of the other into my script. So um, I explore how easy it is to fall into the trap of otherizing a rival group when threat is detected. So I'll talk about my script briefly. Um, this is a mock thumbnail I made for mine. It's called The Show Must Go On. And as hopefully you can tell from this, it is a dark comedy uh, set in the world of theater. Um, this is in the style of a playbill. Um, so it starts with a one-act play, which is set in the 1950s um, with the O'Connor family. Um, they are kind of this poor family living in the suburbs, and a rich new family moves in next door to them, and they start to um, otherize them immediately because they see they're more well-off than they are. Um, this idea of character versus wealth comes up. Um, as the O'Connors value strength of character, and they think that their neighbors having wealth means that they are weak, they are soft. Um, so they end up otherizing their neighbors who just move in that they haven't really met. Here's a um, scene from page 10 um, where Rory, who is the father of the O'Connor family, tells his son about, we've got a new house over there with the new neighbors. Um, he, talk, he mentions that they, they haven't even spoken to their neighbors yet, but he can already tell everything he needs to know about them just from seeing their house and the way that they live. And he even goes as far as to say they represent everything wrong with America. So through this process of otherizing their neighbors, they work themselves up into such a fervor that they end up um, barbecuing their neighbor's dog um, in revenge for the death of their dog, which they think is caused by the neighbors, even though it probably wasn't. Um, so it has this fiery consequence. And then my film cuts to a small um, theater company that is putting on this play. And they talk about, um, they're putting on this play because they want to show how much better we've gotten as a society since the 1950s, which was a time of, you know, um, communism um, versus um, American values. And there was a lot of blind animosity during that era. So the, the, the people of Sullivan's Theater think that we were better than that. So they're putting on this play to show how much better we've come, uh, how much further it comes to the backstage area. Um, they're in this little small theater in this small town of Columbia, Missouri. Um, however, during the script, a rival theater company moves in next door that is very wealthy, as you can tell, they're well-funded. They have all these light shows, they have um, all this technology, um, and the people of Sullivan's Theater start otherizing them, and they have this concept of theater in the fancy way versus theater, like playing theater, is something that becomes important to Sullivan's Theaters. Um, so in a callback to that scene from page 10, um, Jordy, who is the leader of Sullivan's Theater, 
talks about a meeting he has with the, the rival uh, leader. Um, he says, I do not have to spend much time to get a read on him. Um, he goes on to talk about how um, Sullivan's theater has been there for a while, so they're, you could say, native to the area, whereas this rival theater crew just moved in. Um, and he even goes as far as to say they represent everything wrong with theater today. <laughs> um, and it ends with a fiery climax, which I won't spoil here. But basically the idea I wanted to cop talk about in my, my film, which related to the other, is that um, we are perhaps not better than the past, as we often claim to be, because Sullivan Cedar, they always claim to be, oh, we've moved past the 50s, we've moved past this time period of, of blind animosity. However, through the script, it's shown that the idea of the other and otherizing has not um, gone away and continues to plague us today. So, thank you. Presentation, Miles. Um, any questions for Miles? Yes. Um, I just your use of the fifties. There's a, a really good um, visual artist by the name of Mark Can, who I think has some works at the Broad Museum. Okay. Um, which I think you should look at because they're they're sort of very similar. So that's that's, that's not really cool. a question. <laughs> so sorry, but yeah. No, like I said, I also have an art history minor, so I've okay. been to the Broad and I'll, I'll check that. Any other questions, guys? Well, you know, at some point maybe uh, we'll have one of your films uh, where uh, Chloe will be the actor, and you know, <laughs> so we'll start connecting all the, pre the presenters, you know, and maybe uh, Rebecca is going to bring a lamb, right? So, <laughs> so let's let's just see how that works. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. So, rather than me actually introducing um, Rebecca, I would like to invite my colleague Karen Sauvage. Uh, just to say that um, this is part of the collection that Caroline will tell you. Maybe Caroline, you can also say something about the Archaeology Center now. So, yeah. Hello again. Um, so today I'm going to introduce Rebecca and the work that she has been doing for several years, who is still going on in the museum with a brand new team of students um, who will be continuing also next year on the project, which basically is documenting uh, the lamps that we have in the collection in every possible way, including taking pictures, uh, writing a catalog, etc. And Rebecca will say everything about it, so I, I don't want to spoil the presentation. Um, but basically, this is part of an effort to digitize our collection uh, step by step, and we've got a huge collection, and this effort will take uh, many, many years, probably until I retire. Um, so there will be generations of students working in the museum to digitize uh, all of the objects that we have, and we will go with baby steps and uh, do it one collection or one um, project at a time. So there will be lamp project, there will be a seal project, there will be a bobbit drop project, there will be an Egyptian project, etc. in the future. Um, and students would be welcome to volunteer in the museum or to uh, do it as part of a, of a brand new two unit uh, course that they will be able to repeat um, as many times as they want. Um, on this good note, um, let me introduce Rebecca, who again has been so helpful with this project for four years, five, four, 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 four. yeah. Um, so, please. <laughs> so sorry. Well, thank you, Dr. Sauvage. So, like she mentioned, my name is Rebecca Singleton. I'm a BS candidate in economics with minors in applied mathematics and, of course, classics and archaeology. And this is my presentation on the LMU LAMP project. This presentation in particular was also recently given at the 14th Annual Undergraduate Research Symposium. So this is Honors Research Symposium and a summary of the evolution of lamps with a focus on um, lamps within the LMU, LMU lamp collection was slated to be given at the 2020 um, 60 Second Student Lectures, which I believe was on the 16th of March 2020 and did not happen. Um, but today I'll be talking about the LMU lamp project. Um, under the mentorship of originally Dr. Matthew Dillon and uh, up until his retirement, and now under the mentorship of Dr. Caroline Sauvage. 
So um, I'll be talking briefly about what the collection is, what the collection entails, and our efforts within the, LMU, within the LMU LAMP project, as well as my work as an undergraduate research assistant and how that all happens. So what is the collection? Uh, the LAMP collection is housed in the third floor of University Hall. Um, as I'm sure a few of us know within the Archaeology Center, we have over 270 ancient lamps in this collection. Um, the museum has a lot of other pieces other than lamps, um, but the lamps make up such a large portion um, and they're pretty contained within these two main cases right here. The items were, were acquired either by gift um, or sought after by Father Folco, um, and each one has a certain inventory number to keep track of it. The catalog. So also within the Archaeology Center are all of the catalogs detailing every item held by the university. Um, in particular, the lamps obviously have their own page. Uh, these catalogs are all mostly done by hand by either Father Folco or undergraduate research assistants over the years. They include information on the color of the lamp or any item, the size, any measurements, and sometimes but very rarely pictures of the item. So what's an ancient oil lamp? Well, the earliest ancient oil lamp was developed purposefully in the Mediterranean. It was simply a shard of clay, leftover oil, and some string-like fiber to produce light. Lamps were first purposefully developed and widely used by the Levant in 3000 BCE. Those would have looked something like this one here on the left. These ancient lamps were more trivial, and because of this, societies quickly began to find a way to better the lamp. Beyond a simple bowl, cocked hats, and nozzles, um, the cocked hat is, we see this outer bent rim on this lamp on the left. Um, they were developed to better support a wick and burn for longer. Um, the cocked hat design was a bent out rim, which provided support for the oil and the wick. With a better, more technologically innovative lamp, um, light could thrive for longer within a home or within some structure. The cocked hat lamp was more primitive, primitive, but the invention of the potter's wheel allowed for its useful and simple design to be mass produced for all homes and distributed widely. Um, while the open cocked hat design continued to serve as simple lamps, by the 6th and 7th centuries BCE, with a variety of designs and options, decorated lamps started making their way into the homes of those that could really afford them. Decorated lamps found across sites along the Middle East um, are often noticeably less worn with simpler designs. You can see one of those examples on the right. Um, however, this one on the right is a North African lamp. Um, ancient oil lamps often depict scenes of nature, mythology, spirituality, or even sex. Um, we have things called frog lamps, which are shaped like a frog, um, bollock lamps, um, which have a bollock design, and this one here on the right, the North African lamp, actually has depictions of Christianity, so um, there's like a, there's a rook, um, which is considered more of a, like an ancient Christian symbolism. Um, and lamps burned oil, they decorated homes, they adorned living spaces, and they often found themselves placed in graves to provide the deceased with the ability to find their way into the darkness. Again, that's what we speculate about this one on the right, um, which has notably no char patterns, but I can talk about that more later. What makes these lamps so interesting is their impact and their use within daily life. They can tell us a lot about the socioeconomic status of individuals. They can tell us a lot about the trade within the region, since we find lamps from other areas at certain sites. Um, and I just find them fascinating. Um, when I was in Greece at the ancient city of Thoria, I actually found a piece of a lamp within the dirt. Um, it was really exciting for me to be able to identify it and talk more about it at my final presentation of that project. So let's talk more about the general lamps. So most of the lamps within the LMU lamp collection are actually Hellenistic lamps. Uh, that's when this one is here. This one was likely found in Jerusalem. So Hellenistic lamps and most lamps in general have three main components. The first one is the wick hole. This is where the plant fiber or cotton light string would hang out of and be lit to burn to provide the light. The second portion is the fill hole. That's where you would put some olive oil or some other substance that could burn. And third, more self-explanatory, is the handle. So most lamps within the collection follow this general pattern and have these three main components. So let's talk more about what the project is in particular. The timeline, uh, my association with the project, and also the project's associations within the university. So the LAMP project actually began in August of 2018 as my at my first semester at LMU um, under the mentorship of, as I mentioned, Dr. Matthew Dillon in, within the Department of Classics and Archaeology. It aimed to photograph and digitize all the LAMPs that the university held with, to create a collection and create an online database that could be accessed by researchers all around the world. We felt that these LAMPs provided a lot of important information that researchers could 
widely have access to given the size of our collection. So we utilize professional photography equipment, general Photoshop protocol, the Munsell color system, which I'll talk more about in a minute, and expert analysis of the collection to provide, to create this database, um, to hopefully move on to create an online database for researchers all around the world. So this is a brief timeline of our project. As I mentioned before, we began in August of 2018. I was one of the first undergraduate research assistants um, alongside Stephanie Milbro, who just graduated in May of 2021. By January of 2019, Stephanie and I have received an honor semester research grant to fund a new light box and new camera equipment um, to create more professional museum quality photos. And by March of 2019, we began working with the William H. Hannon Library um, to create that online database and understand what that database would look like and the components required to really put that out there into the world. By March of 2020, unfortunately, the COVID-19 pandemic halted our work within the Archaeology Center, um, and the LMU Land Project was temporarily halted. But before March of 2020, the LMU Land Project had spent over 200 combined hours cataloging and photographing the lamp collection, and that led to, oh, I don't have that on the next slide, but that led to over 110 uh, entries within, to our, within our online database. So um, these are a few pictures of really what goes on in the lab and what our project looks like. Um, this is the light box that we use to place, place the lamp in here to get better lighting. Um, and we take two main pictures. The first one is a forward-facing photo of the lamp, usually propped up on some sort of... The words escape me, but it's usually propped up. Um, and then we also take an overhead photo. Sometimes in the case of lamps with potter's marks or stamps on the bottom, we take a photo of the bottom of the lamp as well. And all of these are up to general museum quality. This is a picture of how we take measurements and how we formulate data about the lamp. So this book right here is called the Munsell Color Book. What it allows us to do, it allows us to determine a universal coloring um, category for each lamp. So we search for the color that best matches what the lamp is made of. And this is an important data point, and especially when we talk about a database for other researchers who can filter by color or by region or by um, date, having that color is very important. So this is a universal system. Um, we hold this book up to the lamp to determine the color. Um, and th this is also used at field sites. I use this um, at one of my field projects in Virginia, and we just suck it in the dirt to determine the color. Well, that's what we do with the lamps as well. Um, this is a caliper that we use to measure the lamp. We measure height, depth, and width um, to get a better understanding of the lamp without actually holding it. So what did we accomplish? Like I mentioned before, we have 110 entries into our digitized database. That's 110 items with complete measurements, Munsell category color, historical context, and detailed description. That historical context is provided by experts within the Department of Classics and Archaeology, that being Dr. Matthew Dillon, Dr. Carleen Sauvage, um, and the writings of Father Folka, who usually detailed these as well. We have 108 professionally photographed lamps with, with at least two pictures per lamp, all up to museum quality, and we have 22 raw images processed through Adobe Photoshop. So this is a snapshot of what our database looks like. As you can see, each LMU inventory number is detailed and kept consistent with the original catalogs. Um, we have a general description provided with um, information provided by the experts. We have approximate dates, um, usually informed by Father Folco. Um, we have original provenances, acquisition data, um, and other data such as like height, depth, width, color, et cetera. So this is an example of one of the lamps that we photographed. This one in particular has three photos because on the bottom of the lamp, there is a potter's mark, a potter's stamp. So this is one of the inventory pieces, and this is its entry into the digital database. And this is what the catalogs looked like originally before we digitized it. As you can see, um, it's mostly handwritten, partially typed. And this one, we were actually lucky enough to have a photo of it. But this is what we translated into for the database. Um, this is another piece. This is just demonstrating the pictures that we had before within the catalogs. Um, and sometimes the scarcity of the information we have on each lamp. This one's an Islamic lamp in particular. Um, and the photographs that we take in comparison. Um, as I proceed to pass on this project and as we train new research assistants, um, we've actually created a digitized project handbook or manual 
which includes information on how to handle the lamps, how to name the photographs, how to take the pro photographs, and anything they may need. Our um, long-term goals for the project. So the LMU LAMP project is a prime example of ongoing research at LMU. I've been working on this project for a few years, and I'm happy to say the project will likely continue for a few more years. Um, Dr. Savage and I actually recent, recently trained brand new undergraduate research assistants to work on this project. But a collection of this size, over 273 individual items, does require many years to complete. And the nature of this project involves consistent work and academic collaboration from undergraduate research assistants and experts from the departments of classics and archaeology. So we hope that uh, this work can set a precedent for future project teams at LMU and can inspire further research endeavors, not only within the Department of Classics and Archaeology, but across the university. All right, and I would like to give additional thanks to the Office of Research and Creative Arts, the Department of Classics and Archaeology, and the University Honors Program for sponsoring this presentation. Thank you. Thank you for this wonderful presentation, for all you've done on this project, Rebecca. Any questions for Rebecca? Yes. Um, it was called the Munsel. Like, yeah. Okay, so is that used to tell exactly what color it is currently or what it would have looked like originally? So what we try to do is we try to find a piece of the lamp that best represents what the terracotta or the clay would have originally looked like. Um, so sometimes that's not always possible because these things are so worn, but we do um, try our best to find the color that represents the original color. So uh, do you know what this lamps have been used for? Have you seen, you said in the last presentation, that there are some that are unused. Yes. And so would you like to speak about the uses of these lamps and those that are not used? Yeah? Yes, of course. I'll just go back to that picture um, so we can see like what's used and what's unused. So actually this one in particular. So um, what we try to focus on is we look around the wick hole to see if there are char marks. That would be these dark markings around. So those char marks tell us whether or not this lamp was actually used, whether or not it actually burned oil and was used within a house as a lamp. Not all lamps have these char marks, such as this North African lamp right here. It does not have char marks. That informs us that this was likely um, either pure decoration, just kept around the house to look pretty. We still do that today. Um, would, wouldn't have been different in ancient times. But sometimes they are used as burial goods. So they're buried with a person. And the purpose is that the lamp can light their way to another world. It can light their way through death. Um, and that's why we have so many lamps without charring marks, because they were buried with people to light their way through the other world. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? OK, maybe we'll pick up later on. So thank you very much, Rebecca. Thank you. So, um, and please reach out to Professor Sauvage as you hear, there is a new program so you can uh, work at the museum. Um, and this is something that we wish we could have offered to Emma uh, when she started in the fall, but the museum wasn't ready. So she took a course with me, classical Hellenism, race and ethnicity. And then uh, we tried to find something that would match her interest in museum studies. So uh, let me introduce you to Emma. And before she comes, I just want to say Emma has done an amazing work throughout her four years. Uh, she has grown one of the students that I have seen grown from her first year until now. Uh, she's worked on an, a number of research projects with me and hopefully this summer uh, we'll see, but we're working on a project that she might be a co-author in an article if all goes well. So let me introduce Emma. Hello, I'm Emma Castro. I'm a graduating senior majoring in classics and archaeology and minoring in history. In the fall of 2021, I took Professor Zachary's course, Classical Hellenism, Race and Ethnicity, sorry. and when I began learning more about the debate surrounding the Parthenon marbles, a 200-year dispute between the United Kingdom and Greece, I decided on my capstone thesis subject. The topic relates to the collections of classical art in the, both the British and Neocropolis museums, and offered a fitting case study that culminates my four years of undergraduate study, my future goals as after graduation, I plan on furthering my learning in the field of museum studies. Before I offer my thesis, I will briefly describe what the Parthenon Marbles debate is and why it deserves the consideration of an erudite audience. The parley began in the early 19th century when a small crowd of Greeks, Turks, and Englishmen 
beheld the removal of a metope from the Parthenon, which is located within the Acropolis in Athens. According to the Earl of Elgin, Thomas Bruce, he had received legal documentation known as a firman from the Ottomans to remove the figures from the Parthenon. This heavily debated petition is something that the British Museum continues to assert as genuine permission for Lord Elgin's relocation of the artifacts. In the centuries since, Greece and the United Kingdom have disputed over the legality issue. However, the argument has shifted course over the years, taking up roots in the notion of cultural heritage. And after spending hours and hours and hours of reading peer-reviewed books and scholarly journal articles from both perspectives of the debate, I began to really understood that I understood essentially nothing about the Parthenon Marvels dispute. I had yet to break the surface of the many aspects that filled the centuries-long discord, making it virtually impossible to firmly take a stance on whether the artifacts truly belong in either Greece or the United Kingdom. However, I tend to kind of lead more towards Greece, but that's not really what I'm focusing on in my paper. I however learn the many ways in which countries seek to form a national narrative and how cultural heritage arises in the process of doing so. Um, while researching, two questions began to form in my mind that I later used as a guide to the formation of my thesis. So the first is, why does Greece seek to connect to their distant past in the formation of a national narrative? And secondly, um, oh, I'm sorry. Wait, no, never mind. This is fine. Okay. Um, what influences have led the United Kingdom to claim the Parthenon marbles as pieces of cultural heritage? I then expanded on these questions as they provided the framework for my thesis of the paper, which is, the debate surrounding the Parthenon marbles is complex. The issue of ownership is not a straightforward question, but rather engaged with the very construction of national narratives in the colonial and post-colonial world. Cultural heritage arguments have been used by Greece and the United Kingdom in the formation of national narratives apparent not only in these countries, but in national histories across the modern and postmodern world. What makes the case of the Parthenon marbles worthy of our scholarly attention is that the artifacts that have been housed in the British Museum are as much of a result of the romantic and neoclassical European imagination of the 18th and 19th centuries as much as evidence of their colonial history. My thesis really only came into fruition after Dr. Zacharia suggested I broaden the scope of my sources used in research, first starting with the history of the Parthenon itself. The Parthenon was constructed in the 5th century following the Persian Wars in commemoration to the goddess Athena. The Parthenon marbles were also sculpted in the 5th century BCE, and at the time they represented democracy, freedom, defeat of the Persians, and unity for the Athenians. All of these ideals reflected what it meant to be an Athenian during the Periclean era, which was roughly 461 to 429 BCE, and influenced the fashioning of a national identity. The purpose of the Parthenon, however, transformed over the coming centuries, later becoming a Christian church and then a mosque. After realizing the many lives of the Parthenon, my research was then spent on the ways in which Greece uses classical past in the shaping of a modern identity. Um, the formation of a national narrative arose in Greece during the 18th century Greek Enlightenment and was further impacted by the Greek War of Independence in the 19th century. Around 200 years into the Ottoman occupation, Europe underwent a movement known as the Age of Reason or the Enlightenment where European society from politics to the sciences experienced major reorientations. One country in particular in Europe that endured radical shifts in its politics and society was France, as they sparked a revolution in 1789. The revolution provided inspiration for the Greek intellectual Advantios Korais, who sought to begin a cultural revolution of sorts in Greece with the help of an enlightened France. Korais believed that modern Greece was in historical decline, especially in relation to linguistics language being one of Herodotus' four markers of identity from its classical past. By the time the 18th century rolled around, there was a major difference between the Greek spoken in the classical past and the Greek which had been influenced by Byzantine rule. Not only did Korais emphasize the reorganization of language, but also looked to the West for assistance in the process of translation in order to regenerate modern Greek civilization. The revival of Greek culture during the Enlightenment promotes a continuous national narrative as it seeks to erase Byzantine influence. The fashioning of a new identity in Greece continued during the Greek War of Independence. And after that ended in 1832, the Greeks finally regained their independence and the now sovereign nation began a search for national identity. As a post-colonial nation state, Greece looked to the classical past to regain a sense of national pride and to create a continuous national narrative. In the fifth century BCE, the Parthenon stood as a symbol of victory over the other, a narrative which could then serve Greece in the Ottoman occupation, which was mid 15th century to mid 19th century, under a similar context. By forging a connection from the past to the present, the Greeks were free from their colonial history. 
Um, national museums in Greece very, stray, very rarely stray away from archaeology in the classical past as a way of engaging cultural heritage objects as evidence of, of a continuous national narrative. The new Acropolis Museum in Greece officially opened its doors to the public in 2009 with its main message clear, that, that the Parthenon marbles were to be returned to Greece and displayed among the rest of the marbles. In doing so, the museum would bridge the gap between Greece and its classical past to con continue this idea of the national narrative. I will now talk briefly describe how the Parthenon marbles fit into the national narrative of the United Kingdom. When the Parthenon marbles were removed from the temple in the early 19th century and brought to England by Lord Elgin, the Romantic aesthetic was taking hold of Western culture. The aesthetic of the Romantic era, era was tied to the idea that fragmented artifacts were authentic to the artists that created them. Since there was an attraction of broken relics, the Parthenon marbles acclaimed admiration for their fragmented and incomplete nature. In the setting of the British Museum, the Parthenon marbles were able, oh, sorry, it is not there. Okay, um, were then subjected to colonial ideas surrounding whiteness, leading to the mistreatment of the artifacts. Under the supervision of Joseph Dubin, the namesake of the gallery in which the Parthenon marbles um, in the British Museum are exhibited, the marbles were stripped of their surface patina. This action was meant to ensure uniform whiteness of the ancient sculptures. In the damage onset by the process of making the marbles appear whiter to visitors at the British Museum is irreversible even in the modern day and continues to serve as a testament to the colonial discourses in the 1800s in Europe. The Parthenon marbles were also exploited by the colonialist mites of the 19th century and were destined to become part of the British national narrative. They fit into the framework of the claim that England was a descendant of classical Athens and their transport to the British Museum would protect the marbles from the barbarism of the Ottomans. The word universal that has been used to describe the British Museum to create the sense that objects held in this major museum would not be so admired if by such a broad range of people if they are not displayed to the public eye. By self-identifying as a universal museum, Britain claims to serve world culture, therefore denigrating the Acropolis Museum to the support of only Athens and Greece. And in concluding my research, I have found that the debate surrounding the Parthenon marbles has been met by a series of changes since its genesis in the 19th century. In modern times, the argument has become a question of contested cultural heritage between Greece and the United Kingdom. Both countries have claimed that the Parthenon marbles, as, as part of their heritage, influenced by colonial and post-colonial discourses of the 18th and 19th centuries. For Greece, the marbles fit into the construction of a continuous national narrative between ancient and modern, which fails to recognize the many lives of the Parthenon. For Britain, the marbles' long residence in the British Museum has an attractive identification between the British population and the artifacts. However, the universality of the museum ignores a past full of imperialism and colonialism. Thank you, Emma. Questions for Emma? Um, for for a while, I heard that like one of the arguments from the British Museum was that uh, Athens didn't have the resources to like hold the marbles, or mm -hmm. there would wouldn't be as much uh, like foot traffic to them. You know, more people attend the British Museum. Is that like, Accurate or is that kind of... Um, well, I mean, like, the new Acropolis Museum has recently opened, and it's, like, pretty state-of-the-art, and they have, like, already a room where they would display the marbles with the rest of the marbles. And in terms of, like, foot traffic, I think it's kind of, like, like, people go to Greece for tourism all the time. It's not, like, no one ever goes there. And I don't necessarily think that in a bigger museum, like, they would be more appreciated, like, in essence, because, like, people go to Greece to see like the sites and like they would go to the museum and like see the Parthenon marbles in the context of the Parthenon. So I don't really like agree that they need to be in Britain to be appreciated by more people. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, they say that like if we return this, then we're gonna have to return everything. Which is kind of funny. Which ones uh, were you comparing it to? Which artifacts? The Benin? Oh yeah, the Benin bronzes. Yeah. Thank you, Emma. Oh, oh Caroline. Conclusion. Oh, sorry. Um, thank you for your presentation. Yeah. Um, 
Um, so originally, like Lord Elgin had um, got a firman from the Ottomans where they basically said like you can like draw the marbles and you can take casts of them um, and he kind of like drew it out and he's like, you know what, like I'm going to take them. And he originally wanted to actually have them in his house, like in his backyard um, to display them. But then um, he ended up selling them to the British Museum. But yeah, there's a lot of controversy controversy over that. Um, but England still asserts that like it's it's a genuine firman from the Ottomans. But yeah, you have uh, she's written a uh, kind of a, a longer uh, piece on this. So um, you left out Melina Mercury. You left out a lot of yeah. things. Yeah. Um, something that is interesting that you also could maybe expand on is um, the Acropolis Museum has artifacts, uh, sort of copies of what exists in the British Museum, which is another call of showcasing that we can actually house them here, look at the copies. And so it was really built as a cry to the world that legally these belong to us. But as we'll see when uh, David comes to the next presentation is um, how it's about erasures, omissions, and commemorations. So which kind of history do you pronounce in the national narrative? So thank you, Emma. Yeah. So let me introduce you to our last student speaker, uh, David Eisman, who is a major in classics and archaeology. He uh, has taken a, a couple of my classes, I think, uh, the ancient world and film, and now the presentations of Greece. Um, and he managed to write in one semester a, um, well, the capstone requirement is 5,000 words and he submitted 8,500 words. Um, and so this is a, um, a presentation of his work uh, where I think it's fitting to uh, what we've heard so far. So the title of his work uh, is up here. Um, let's uh, welcome David. Thank you, uh, Dr. I, for the uh, introduction. Uh, my name is David Eisman, as she said. I'm a senior classics and archaeology major. And I'll be presenting on Greeks, Romans, Nazis, erasures, omissions, and commemorations. So in this class, we were supposed to take a look at many films from the Los Angeles Greek Film Festival. And I chose these two documentary film hybrids, The City in the City and The Students of Umberto Primo. They both talk about this, the events in Thessaloniki, which was this um, Sephardic Jewish metropolis where the majority population, a 96% population, was Jewish. But when the Nazis invaded, by the time they were gone, it was less than 1%. Before we can talk about Thessaloniki, let's talk about the invasion of Greece. In 1941, the Axis powers invaded Greece and they split it up into three distinct domains. The Bulgarian domain, the Italian domain, and the German domain. Within the German domain was Thessaloniki, this Sephardic Jewish metropolis. Here are some images of the Nazis invading this metropolis. And then I also included this specific image of the Nazis invading the Acropolis, because I thought it was just a very striking image. So what is the specific event that I'm looking at that inspired this paper? It's actually two linked events. One is the Black Saturday event at Liberty Square. At Liberty Square, the Nazis forced about 5,000 of the, of the men to gather in the square and basically tortured them for the entire day. They forced them to squat and stand over and over and over again as they beat them, slapped them, made fun of them, and just pushed them to the ground. The reason they were in this square was because they were being registered for forced labor. The forced labor would eventually claim most of their, most of their lives because of the harsh conditions. In order to get these people out of forced labor, the Jewish, pop, the Jewish community at Thessaloniki came up with a plan. They agreed to pay, pay the Nazis two million drachmas, in addition to allowing them to completely destroy the Jewish cemetery at Salonika. They dug up the graves, they destroyed all the tombs, and they reused the, the rubble to build roads and pools. In addition to selling the land, 
to the Aristotle University of Thessalonica. So what am I talking about with these documentaries? Well, I'm going to talk about in a little bit the Nazi mythological system of erasing cultures and their histories. And what these two documentaries do, The City and the City and The Students of Umberto Primo, is to revive the voices of those who were erased and forgotten and lost during the Nazi occupation. I'll talk about how that works in later slides, but let's first talk about the mythological system of the Nazi Reich, which had three distinct points. First, steal and distort the cultural mythologies of classical antiquity. Second, create cultural mythologies to aggrandize the Reich while demonizing the other, in this case, the Jews. And then third, erase the presence and legacy of the other. Before we can talk about the exact definitions of each of these three points, let's talk about the three forms of mythology. You have first pantheonic. This is how ancient civilizations would describe the natural phenomena in their world through these pantheonic um, deities. Zeus controlling the thunder and the lightning, Poseidon in the sea. It's how cultures interact with their theologies. Semiotic philosophy. Semiotic mythology is the second type. It's introduced in Roland Barr's mytho mythological work, and it's basically the, the mythology of signs, how denotations and connotations can be combined together to create the mythology of objects, as well as cultures and the individual signs. And finally, cultural mythologies, which is part most, most of what my paper talks about. Cultural mythologies are how cultures view themselves, these could be foundational myths, such as the myth of Aeneas combined with Romulus and Remus, and how the Romans viewed themselves as descendants of gods and the ancient Trojans. And it can also be the theory of Nordic Hellenism, which I'm going to talk about in a bit, which is the cultural part of the cultural mythology of the Nazi Reich. So let's talk about the Nazi resignification of cultural mythologies. Here's where I'll talk about the theory of Nordic Hellenism, which is crazy. This man, Hans Gunther, was a Nazi philosopher who basically wrote a large volume of works claiming that all of classical civilizations were actually Germans. They were Nordic Germans. He, in his book, some dubious uh, scholarship, one of, his main, one of his main points was that you can compare mythologies of Greece and Rome to certain Scottish and German mythologies, and therefore, they must have been German. His funniest point was the, the idea that the word iris translates to rainbow, and since iris refers to the eyes, and Greeks only had brown eyes, and Germans had multicolored eyes, therefore the Greeks must have been Germans. As you can see, a lot of his points don't really hold up when examined individually, but when combined in this large volume of work that was eventually reiter reiterated upon and developed with more scholarship, it almost appeared as though his theory made sense. This adoption and distortion of cultural mythologies of classical antiquity allowed them also to claim the Republic of Plato and completely warp what he was saying. In the Republic of Plato, Plato describes a great myth, which he admittedly is used for authoritarian control of the populace because he hated the demos, he thought democracy was dumb, and he loved Sparta. In this great myth, um, people were told that they were born from three metals, those born from gold would become the rulers, those born from silver would be the soldiers, and those born from lesser metals, like copper and iron, would be the producers, the lower regs of society. Hans Gunther took that and said what Plato was actually saying is that those born from gold were Germans, and that everyone else were bad and impure, that only pure Germans and pure Aryans can be philosophers. Now, they also, this... This is the right, angled the right angled cross. Many people know it as the swastika. It is not a Nazi symbol. This is from a 4,000-year-old Mesopotamian pottery found in Samara. This is just another example of the Nazis taking a symbol, distorting it, and making it malicious. In addition to Sparta, the Nazis loved the idea of Sparta as this society of warriors who were oligarchical and, did and only cared about pure blood. And they were able to use this propaganda during the Battle of Stalingrad to basically say that those Nazi soldiers were actually descendants of the 300 warriors at Thermopylae 
reincarnations of them, and it was their duty to protect Germany against the Russian barbarians who were actually Persians. Now, since we've learned that the Nazis took the culture mythologies of Greece and Rome and distorted them for their own purposes, let's just briefly take a look at Greece and Rome and how they actually viewed themselves in terms of culture mythologies. While Greece as a whole is very complicated and their individual culture mythologies are distinct and unique, the cultural mythology of Athens works really well for us, especially in post-Persian War Athens. Oh, sorry. Here on the Parthenon, they were, eight, they were using the Centauromachy and the Amazonomachy iconographies to, in standing in place of the Persians. By describing them as centaurs and women, they were saying that the, bar, that the Persians were barbaric, animalistic, effeminate, and therefore the, the Athenians were just and right in dispelling them that they were great warriors. And then the cultural mythology of the Roman Empire which is almost perfectly shown in the Gemma Augustea, which shows Augustus surrounded by gods and personifications, crowning him um, with a victorious wreath. The person crowning him is Quikamene, which is the personification of civilization. And on the bottom register is a bunch of slaves who were just nearly conquered, the Illyricans, being dragged by other gods. The purpose of this is that Augustus is bringing civilization to these barbaric lands and that he's the ruler over land and sea. And this is basically the cultural mythology of the Roman Empire. They would conquer lands, they would enslave the populace, and say they brought civilization. And by bringing civilization, they would build monumental architecture. This is the Arch of Tiberius in their lands that detailed exactly how they killed them the last time to say, if you do this again, we're going to kill you again, and then build another monumental architecture showing how we beat you. So now that we've learned about that, let's go back to the, the Reich, the Nazi Reich. They were able to use art just like, the, just like the Romans and just like the Greeks, but in a different method. They used film to aggrandize themselves instead of monumental architecture. In this film, Olympia, by Leni Riefenstahl, every single German athlete is depicted as a reincarnation of sculpture. This image is very evocative of the Discopolis, a classical archeological sculpture of, a, of, a, of an Olympic athlete throwing the discus. In this film, Lenny Riefenstahl had a very specific goal. She wanted to show that Nordic Hellenism was a correct theory, that the Greeks and that the Nazis were actually descendants, reincarnations of the, of the Greeks, which were actually German, by the way. And then they were also able to demonize the Jewish people as the other. While monumental architecture took decades to build and could only be in one place, propaganda posters, as shown in these four, could be mass-produced and placed everywhere. These are very upsetting images, but they display the Jews in a very stereotypical and horrible method, using this black coat and the black hat, the over-large hooked nose, and this gr grubbing, money-hungry demeanor. And then these two are very explicit. This one says, the, when the, the vermin are exterminated, the oak will flourish, meaning that when the Jews are killed off, Germany will finally be able to flourish again. And the final one says, Jew, Jews are lice, they cause typhus. This is a Polish poster. It was primarily shown in Poland to show that the Jews are terrible, they're demons, you must get rid of them. Now let's go back to the historical practice of, practices of erasure. When the Nazis destroyed the cemetery at Salonika, they were, they were attempting to completely erase the Jewish presence from that city. Not just the people, but their heritage, their legacy. But this practice is not specific to them. Lots of cultures throughout history have practiced a cultural erasure. In Rome, you had the practice of Donatio Memoria. The emperor would damn the previous emperor who was considered bad, and then agents of the emperor would go out and destroy every single iconography or replace him. This is a statue of Domitian, once Domitian, but when he was damned, they just cut off his face and replaced it with Nerva, a good emperor. This is a granite statue of Hatshepsut in Egypt. I thought including something besides Greece and Rome would show that this is a common practice. When the son, the stepson of Hatshepsut, Tatmos III, Came, Septimus II came into power, he had all of her statues smashed, and those that couldn't be smashed, he, changed, he stamped out her name and replaced it with his. In addition, on the Acropolis, there was once 
of Ottoman mosques and a Christian church. But when the Greeks regained independence, they destroyed all that because they wanted to show, no, this is our land. This is Greece. We don't want the Ottomans here. We don't want the Christians here. But it's these places were there. They were attempting to create a new narrative by destroying these buildings. Just as the, the Nazis were attempting to completely erase the Jews from Thessaloniki. Which brings us back to these films. In the, in the City in the City, by showing a scene in biopic re reenactment of Black Saturday, you come to see these people as humans. You see their fear, you see the unjustness, you see how they tremble, you see their anger. And then when we go to the still photographs of the actual event, you can see the emotions, you can feel what they felt because you had just seen it in live action. If they had just shown the still photographs, you wouldn't get the same effect. You would just see them as someone would looking at a history textbook or a regular documentary. You wouldn't understand the emotions of these people. The students of Umberto Primo does another certain thing. In the building that once housed this school, one of the professors on one night found letters from students that were in the school during the Nazi invasion. These nine students, as you can see, most of them died during the forced labor campaigns. And in this film, they show, they have the letters narrated while actors perform reenactments. And you get to see them not only as just dead people in still photographs, but as individuals. While the actors reenact the, the events, the narrator, of, of which is performed by the actors, read the letters by these people so you get to understand them on an individual humanistic level. And I'll just leave you with a quote from my paper that I think demonstrates my thesis very well. The Nazi Reich created a system of propaganda which not only re-signified the mythologies of classical antiquity, but also sought to physically and semiologically erase the Jewish people. But the city and the city and the students of Umberto Primo Revive the voices of those who were lost and forgotten. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, questions for David? <laughs> uh, really very touching. Um, I, I'm just wondering, you know, like, I, I don't know much about the, the Nazi invasion of Greece, but do you know anything about whether there was sort of how the Nazi aggrandizement of, of, of Greek civilization and culture kind of was, was how Greeks who were being invaded responded to that because there was also a kind of valorization of the classical past by Greek nationalists. I mean, how did you know how they responded to this, you know, this foreign invader that was also kind of, you know, valorizing or glorifying parts of the classical past, but in a way that was obviously hostile yeah. and destructive? It is an interesting point. Um, the Greeks definitely didn't respond well. They, these were these foreign invaders claiming that they were the true inheritors of classical antiquity. The Nazis didn't view the Greeks who were there as true Greeks because they believed that the true Greeks were actually Nordic Hellenists. They were Germans. But you can actually see in modernity that like parties like the Golden Dawn and the reemergence of neo-fascism in Germany, sorry, in uh, Greece is kind of a response to that because there has been like certain factions like the Golden Dawn who will go to Thermopylae and pretend that they are continuing this legacy of the valiant Spartans fighting against the barbarians. So it's definitely had a lasting impact on Greece. Well, I have a lot of questions, but I'll add them to my comments, right? Um, could you tell us something about what we see on the screen? <laughs> this one? Yeah. It's a dabbing squirrel. <laughs> Okay, so talk to us about what you do because um, I want to follow up with something. So why don't you talk about your animation? Oh yeah, um, I run an uh, I run an independent animation studio called Stonefish Animation with my best friend. It's a two D hand drawn animation studio. He does all the individual art. I do the timing and the editing and the sound effects. Additionally, I'm on the board of directors of an animation nonprofit called Animation Resources directed by Stephen Wirth, who's a legendary animation producer and director. Um, our mission is to educate students in animation history and theory, um, as well as provide reference packs and articles and an animation archive that's directly from Steve's private collection. 
and what is a recent project that was inspired by classic? Yes. See, I'm plugging in, you know. <laughs> I would have shown it, but uh, we are currently working on a short film that is directly uh, adapted from The War of Frogs and Mice, which is a Hellenistic poem, which is a parody of the Iliad, um, which the Trojan War. We're also working on an adaptation of A True History, uh, which by Lucius, which is a very, very funny um, epic poem, which is basically about uh, Greeks going into space um, on their act on their like real ship, and then like and seeing like uh, space battles with giant spiders who spin webs in front of planets and stuff. It's crazy. Thank you, David. <laughs> so I. Um... I wanted David to talk about this because when uh, he came, I didn't say much because I had a plan. So the plan is that uh, this is the moment that we deliver our awards. And this year's award for the uh, highest GPA, 3.96, and the uh, scholarly uh, contribution to the department goes to David Eisman. So David. To also tell you that because in recent years we um, we were a department that had many tracks and then probably about eight or so years ago the Department of Classics and Archaeology that still has and uh, caters to so many interests we became one major CLAR Classics and Archaeology so I'm a, the new chair that uh, became chair of almost a year ago, and I started digging. We found we have a, an O'Neill Endowment Award, which means that every year there is some money that could go towards students. What I didn't know is how much, and after some digging, I can tell you that this comes with a $500 award that is given to David Eisman for his animation, so that we hope that this is gonna be animated and we can see on our screen. So, David. Wow. A little certificate. A little certificate for you. So at Thank the you. end we will. Uh, Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Very proud. So uh, we will have some more pictures. And I wanted. To, this is the moment that I I want to acknowledge all the people that have helped us get this far, um, and welcome a few of you who are here. So. Um, the first person that I'd like to introduce, and you may already have met her, is our new Senior Administrative Assistant, Isabel Davis. So why don't you get up, Isabel, and say hello. So Isabel uh, organized all of this as well as the lunch, as well as so many other projects, including our transition, uh, space transition projects that you see our little seminar room. Um, she received her MFA from LMU and finished, I believe, last year and started with us in January. So I am grateful to have her here. She will also be helping us with spotlighting students and alums. And yes, we're fundraising. Yes, we are. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank yeah. you, guys. Yeah. Nice meeting you guys. And to those I haven't met yet, I'm sure I will in the future. So it's nice to be a part of this program. Thank you, Isabel. Um, so another person that has uh, really helped us um, revive our Classics and Archaeology website and done so much for technology for us uh, is our um, guru, um, Shane Yano. Our, and Shane, can you come up here? Um, <laughs> Shane has also helped Caroline create a sign-up page and has been uh, uh, so valuable that before he graduates, uh, we're so proud of He's going to Japan, and we're so proud of what he's done so far. But um, I'm just going to clone him. We need a few in every department. Uh, so this is, I nominated you, and so this is the student of employee year. No, it's about you. 